Thanks for joining us for the continuation of today's live sitting of the House of Assembly. We now take you over to the House Speaker, Honorable Andy Daniel, for the official commencement of today's sitting. I beg to remind honorable members that when the House last ro rose, the motion in debate was that Parliament authorized the Minister of Finance to borrow US $16,192,000 from the Caribbean Development Bank for the purpose of financing the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project. And be it further resolved that, A, in case of the special funds resources portion, one, the loan is repayable in 80 equal and approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement or on such later due date as a bank may specify in writing. And two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5 percent per annum withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the special funds resources portion. B, in case of the ordinary capital resources portion, one, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement on such later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank may specify in writing. Two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.97% per annum, withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion. And three, a commitment charge at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion on withdrawn and which accrues from the 60th day following the date of the loan agreement. Honorable Member for Viewport South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, although I missed uh, part of the, the earlier part of the debate on this motion before the House this morning, or and this afternoon rather, I understand that my colleagues have rehearsed the history and have given some indication of how this loan um, came about. And from what I've gathered, no one on this side of the house has spoken against this loan in any significant or material way. There is, of course, understandably disagreement as to how the loan should be utilized and for what purposes and for what. But um, that apart, there is no major um, disagreement in principle or otherwise to the procurement by the government of St. Lucia for this loan because the negotiations commenced with the former government and in fact it emerged out of some, some degree of agreement with the former government. That being said, uh, Mr. Speaker, there will always be issues of disappointment. And for me, I think um, one disappointment has to do with the fact that in this early stage of the loan and given the closure of the B program, the eminent um, closure of that program, it has run its course, that the opportunity was not taken to invest very early in 
the Donata School to build a new school for the students of Donata. I think that is a very, very, very real disappointment because I think we really need in, to come to terms in our parliament and in the country as a whole with the way we handle and treat disabled children in our community and the issues regarding disabled or challenged children as a whole. And when I go back um, into the administration of education in St. Lucia, I think it is it's fair to say that policymakers have had emotional and sometimes intellectual difficulty in terms of deciding what to do with our challenged students and what degree of investment we should put in them. And I'm not at this stage blaming any administration, although I have a profound disappointment that the allocation to disabled families was reduced so significantly as occurred. I think that's a travesty because really that um, grant should have been doubled, but that's another issue. There, there are so many issues regarding how we handle such children. And I repeat that there's been a lot of restlessness. I don't think we ourselves have been as sure as we should be about what are the policy positions to take and how to approach the problems that exist with disabled or challenged students. The former minister, Dr. Robert Lewis, did a correct thing on the initiative of the Caribbean Development Bank at the time, and as you heard from my colleagues, to visit Barbados to look at the Barbadian school plant because they have invested heavily in um, education for challenged students, disabled students, over time. And coming out of this is the report that reference was made to this, this, this morning. And there, there are really so many issues regarding disabled children that um, I think it would take far more than a loan of this magnitude to resolve those particular kinds of, of issues. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, the, the fact of the matter is that there are so many practices occurring in our education system that are wrong. I mean, quite often than not, we do not regard teachers of disabled children as professionals in their own right, possessing certain kinds of, of skills. Instead, sometimes we believe that even within the school system, you give teachers deliberately to teach children who are challenged, who have difficulties for the very simple reason that they figure, that the, the administration of these schools figure that um, it will make less demands on the, very, on the various teachers, it wouldn't be difficult, etc. Of course, that's patently false because there are, there are very rare challenges that occur from, from time to time. But despite all the training over the years, we do not have a ready pool of talent that is available. There has been some training in the past, but simply not enough. But as a new phenomena developing within the school system, and that is a phenomenon that I want to spend a few moments on addressing. That is to say that the school system is now being challenged by students who, or by children who do not necessarily fall on the side of the challenged or disabled, but who have major behavioral problems. And the school system is at a quandary as to what to do with these children. And while for me, I am limited by what I can say on this matter, because I, I represent parents, one particular parent in one case, so I have to be cautious and careful. But it points to a deeper problem. That, for example, if these students emerge as having behavioral problems, you get referrals being made to the wellness center, that these students are being asked to go to the wellness center for evaluation. I, I just want to say to you, Mr. Speaker, can you imagine the trauma of sending 
a nine-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old to the wellness center to be evaluated by one of the psychiatrists at the wellness center. And these things are occurring in the school system at the moment. And these are students with behavioral problems that really the school system does not know how to handle or what to do with these students because the teachers within the school are totally at a sea, totally at a loss as to how they should tackle these problems. Now, you'll be amazed, Mr. Speaker, the kinds of, of issues, and I just, I'm not going to digress, but to emphasize the peculiarity of the problem. Only yesterday, I had a discussion with some, some parents who were pointing out and, or some individuals rather, and I, I wouldn't of course name them, parents and um, daughter children. And they were making the point, for example, that there have been incidents in the school system where children have been major challenges to their teachers and to their principals. They're exhibiting very antisocial behavior. And uh, when, in one instance, the confidence of a particular child was, was um, secured, the child in confidence told the individual concerned, well, one of, the, um, one of the things that happens is that on mornings, I'm often given marijuana tea for the day. Now, I want to make it very clear that I'm one of those who believe that the point we have reached the point where we have to decriminalize. There's no question about that. Um, the momentum has the momentum is unstoppable, and uh, whether we like it or not, we will have to move in, the di in that direction, especially what is happening in the rest of the Caribbean, and of course, even in our main source markets in Canada and in the United States. Now, whether it's uh, an issue that the entire society has to discuss, but the reality of that situation is that you already have Antigua moving in a certain direction, Jamaica has gone in a, a certain direction, and others are rapidly following. Now, I say this, Mr. Speaker, to point out that if the day comes when there is decriminalization, the country will face major public health issues. And the challenge will be, in the short term, to handle the public health issues that arises. So for example, the kind of problem that you would have with a child being sent to school with some marijuana tea in the morning is a public health issue. And of course, it would seem to me that the parent who was involved in this matter really should have engaged not just counselors but others to point out the very real danger that is occurring. But here is a parent attempting to deal with some behavioral problems of a child, but she's creating more behavioral problems as a direct result. And what is happening is that the school system does not have the capacity to address problems like that affecting our children. Now they are not, and I repeat, they are not children who are disabled. They are not children who are um, challenged, but they are children who have been socialized into a certain social environment. They have been children who are encountering particular difficulties at home, and they are children who are therefore manifesting this antisocial behavior in the classroom, in the school environment, but the school does not know how to deal with it. Well, alcohol as well, I mean, is an issue. And at least alcohol is being dealt with, as I said, as a public health, public health issue in much the same way that the day 
marijuana is ever decriminalized, then it, becomes a, it will become a public health issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I say this um, to make two points. First, when this project was originally conceived, the principal emphasis really was on dealing with um, children who are challenged for one reason or another, who are disabled for one reason or other, and of course, um, the early stages of, of um, preschool education. It seems that there has been some shift in focus. And my regret is that even if we had had some shift in focus, that the opportunity was not taken to construct a new school for the children who are disabled because of the, um, the unusual difficulties we have had with Donata. Mr. Speaker, I am aware that an area of land has been made available to the association in question next to the Impulet Louise Primary School, but I suspect that there has been little progress in moving towards the construction of a replacement school. And I, I really hope that this is a matter that we can take on board and can be taken on board very, very early and very, very quickly. The second reason, Mr. Speaker, why I'm making this intervention is, to, is this issue of the, the children with behavioral challenges. And the report out of Barbados, prepared by the former minister and his staff, did make the observation, which I think is eminently sensible, that in Barbados, the government has developed particularly, particular centers um, throughout the island in key, um, in key positions. And they staff those centers with counselors. They staff them with um, doctors and social workers, of course, as well as, as teachers. But what happens is, that once the child has been identified as a child with a behavioral problem or behavioral disorder, the child is then sent to those centers for guidance and for instruction and hopefully reintegration in the school system. I think this is really a very sensible approach. And while I hear the, just in time to hear the, uh, member for Miku North um, enunciate and elucidate on some of the um, interventions that will occur, which of course includes policy formulation, et, et, et cetera. I hope that this is one suggestion that can be actively pursued, especially in the urban center in the north, because it cannot ever, ever be right for children with behavioral problems to be sent to the Mental Wellness Center for evaluation. Likewise, Mr. Speaker, you ask, do we have any clinical psychologists who look after children? Do we have any child psychologists? And the answer is that they are exceedingly difficult and rare and cannot be easily found. So most parents then, what they do is to try and get hold of counselors for some guidance and for some advice with the result that that can only be a partial solution if only for the very simple reason that behavioral problems of children are so very complex and so very difficult that a special kind of expertise is needed to deal with it. Now, whether the approach by the government has amputated the options here um, is, of course, a point for reflection, because my understanding was and is that the former government had, in fact, um, asked the CDB for a more substantial sum of money for this program. But the current government, in its wisdom, decided to reduce the amount that was requested. And uh, while reducing the amount that is requested, identified other priorities within, of course, the existing loan program. I just hope 
that along the way we can rethink this somewhat and even if you're going to eventually get a consultant to give you some policy options and policy priorities that we begin to move on to some of these existing problems that we have because it is these experiences that are making the lives of teachers and principals and even parents unbearable because there are parents out there who simply do not know what to do and they believe that once they encounter these problems then the solution is simply um, either, as I said, go to the wellness center, get a, somebody to evaluate, or refer the children to the police who are perhaps even more ill-equipped to handle the difficulties that we have. But I am deeply concerned, Mr. Speaker, about the rising incidence of antisocial behavior within the school system and, of course, the um, inability of the system to deal with those issues. And I hope that um, rather than the delay that is inevitably going to occur out of any policy analysis that will emerge and so prolong the problem, that there are some immediate interventions that can be taken to deal with the problem. I am aware, Mr. Speaker, that under the original proposal, a sum of money was supposed to have been made available to repair the Center for Disabled Children in G4. Of course, I am not going to comment um, on how it is that Viewfort seems to suffer so much at this day's sitting. I leave that for another day. But that being said, I hope the Minister of Education might have taken the opportunity to perhaps even give some comfort to the parents of the Beanfield Secondary School, because I know my colleague to my left has spoken on the challenges facing the parents of the Beanfield Secondary School who have been told that despite the fact that choices, that the parents made choices for the Beanfield Secondary School, they must now um, withdraw these choices and make new choices to other schools in the area that they would be assigned to. The parents have, of course, flatly refused to do so. And they have indicated that they will not pursue that approach. May I suggest, Mr. Speaker, that this situation should not be allowed to get out of control. And what the parents really want is a meeting with the minister to discuss the issue and resolve the issue because there are solutions to that problem that does not necessarily involve the transfer of the children to other schools in the South, thereby increasing the cost of education for those parents. And the parents, of course, are adamant too because the Beanfield Secondary School has also emerged now as a school of Tremendous credibility, I would say, after just a few years, that the percentage cut off for entry into the school is in fact in the 60s, just below the Vieux Senior Comprehensive Secondary School. So I would hope that the minister will ask for a meeting with the parents as the parents have been asking to resolve this issue. They are quite right that the policy implications of the ministries or the department's decision cannot be settled with junior officials of the Ministry of Education. And if I can offer the minister any comfort, I will not be at the meeting. You may come down, I will not be at your meeting. So, um, but I hope you can find it within yourself to make sure that you come down to the school, meet the parents and have a frank an open discussion to resolve this matter. Because if that does not happen, I think that would create unnecessary conflict and tension within the school that can easily be avoided and resolved. That having been said, Mr. Speaker, um, despite the fact that we now have a truncated program, I certainly welcome the investment in this sector. I'm sorry that the, the full value 
of the allocation to the students of disabled community, the challenged students, are not reflected in the existing plans. And I think that's really a very sad, but I hope that other initiatives can at least proceed in the planning process rather than wait for any policy output from consultants appointed by the Caribbean Development Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Castries South East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a very interesting debate taking place on the issue of education and what is happening to our school plan and our school facilities. The requirements of this loan in order to help improve school plan on the island. Mr. Speaker, I would assume that if we would spend the entire budget, we would still not be able to meet all of the needs of the education system at this point in time. And I need to emphasize a couple of points on this as we go forward. Over the years, we've been putting patches on the problems that we are seeing. We have not had a holistic approach towards our planning, our developing, our organizing. And I heard quite a bit of criticism coming to the Prime Minister by the member for Viewfort North, indicating that misguided, it was a misguided concept that your curriculum should influence the type of building or the type of school plan that we should have. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I see members on the other side are very edgy about everything that is said. But I will, I will focus on what is before us today. They have other times to talk to what you are talking about there. Mr. Speaker, the member was emphasizing that now the Prime Minister is coming out here and speak about loan for the equip project and whatever, and just the other day he was speaking about um, curriculum must be developed. What is far from the truth in terms of what the member said? And that's why Hansard maybe should be replayed, or there should be a replay of what members say in this honorable house. Because some people take liberty to mislead this honorable house, and they always deny they never said that. And when you go back, you see exactly what was said. So looking at education, and you would think the members oppose it. And that is why it is important for us to understand how we found ourselves where we are today. Of the last 20 years, the Labour Party administration would have governed this country for 15 of those 20 years. The problems that emerge in our schools did not emerge yesterday. The deplorable conditions at Sir Arthur did not happen overnight. A building could not get to the condition that it is. But you see, we know we have limited resources. We cannot give the perception that we can do everything and we can fix everything. 
the Minister for Education was heavily criticized recently by the Labour Party administration or the Labour Party um, MPs in relation to what happened at the schools in, for the opening of school in Mikut. Did the Mikut schools get to the situation that they were in the 18 months that we were in office? in the two years, and if you want to say two years. When we speak about what has happened with the school plant, and I heard the member for Castries is giving all of the stats, but he never answered the question put by the member for Babondo as to why the Lager School, the plans for the Lager School was discontinued. He gave his stats. But he never said they stopped the plan. But I'm listening, and I'm hearing the member for Viewfort South now talking about plans for the school and how the parents may not accept what is proposed. So are these same figures that was quoted by the member for Castries East? Is it something that applies? And if we are going to have a frank discussion, about the education system, about what we need to do as a country within the limited resources that we have. This is not a matter to play politics with. This is a matter to come straight with the people and tell them this is what it is, this is what can be done, this is what we can afford. And I have to compliment the Minister of Education because she's found herself in a very difficult place at this point in time. Inheriting school plan that was heavily neglected. Especially the last five years of the Labour Administration. And these are not, these are not just words. Go and check the budgets and see what the allocation. When the decision was made by the then government to remove the repairs of school plan from the Ministry of Education and placed under the Ministry of Infrastructure, that was a dive in the wrong direction. And there were no improvements. I can tell you, when I went, when the principal of the Forestier Combined School called me, you know what they found? They found that rats were coming right into the food that was being, that was there to be stored and to be cooked for the children. Because the netting that was supposed to be in the flower blocks to secure the building could not have been done. You know what we had to do? It was through CDP. We were able to secure that environment, knowing the problems that you've had with leptospirosis, and, and the spread of diseases through these rodents. So, so, Mr. Speaker, these things are not new. I heard the member for Viewfort North talk about the legacy or, or the history of the Labour Party with education. And we've heard all the boast about universal secondary education was accomplished under them. But they never gave credit to all the secondary schools that was built between 1964 and 1997. Where is the record for that? Because at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, education should not be about who did what. All governments have contributed in a meaningful way to education. But we have a problem, Mr. Speaker. And the problem is, when we were making, when the then government made projections for universal secondary education, and I will tell you, Mr. Speaker, when people have no vision, you cannot expect better from them. So what were the stats showing? You pass an abortion bill, which means that the likely result is a reduction in the number of children that would be born. 
Then, then, Mr. Speaker, there is a complaint. There is a complaint that the number of students in schools are under decline. <coughs> now, now, there are a number of factors that can contribute to the reduction. So, what does an abortion bill do? Mr. Speaker, I am. A letter member for Central Castries answer you no, on that. We're already on this side. There's no need for that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, no Mr. Speaker, <laughs> on the plan, when you look at when you look at the factors that influence the reduction in the number of students that you have in schools. Anybody planning, if you're planning a business, if you're planning, if you're planning to build a hotel, you must know where you're going to market. Exactly. You must know what the market is going to be. And in doing so, Mr. Speaker, you would know if you need to build a 10 room or a 20 room hotel. If you're going to plan any business, any business you're going to plan, Mr. Speaker, you need to do it in a manner where you know what your projections are for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. So I want to ask, all of these additional space that we have in the schools today, did the then planners who are sitting on the opposite side there, did they have these plans in projection? What were the stats showing you in terms of where we were going? What is because we are talking about primary school, but Mr. Speaker, it is the primary schools that feed the secondary schools. And obviously, if your numbers are going down in the primary schools, it will go down even further in the secondary schools because you have dropouts between primary and secondary school. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I see the member is interested in, in my private life, but <laughs> the Honorable, number y'all have given me on Honorable Facebook Member for Castro South Face. Huh? Why are you allowing yourself to be distracted? I'm not distracted, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, they know how many they've given me on Facebook already. So. so, Mr. Speaker, going back to the core, because you see, when one government makes a bad decision, whether it be a UWP government or an SLP government, there's a trickle-down effect on the country for years and years to come. So, the fact of the matter is, we built new schools, and then we don't have students to put into the schools. But we know our people. We understand them. That's what they're accustomed to. There's a school... 500 yards from my home, how dare you tell me my child cannot go to that school anymore, but they must go to a school that is one mile away. That's the reality of our people. But as politicians and as policy makers, are we going to be honest with the people and tell them that if we consolidate, if we do what we have to do, we can offer better quality at a higher standard for the same price than if we were to spread ourselves too thin. So, the fact of the matter is, if I had, I can tell you, when I went to the forest air school, there was over 150 students there. Now the, the numbers are down to about 80 students. If I have to go and tell the people, we need to close the school in forest air and merge it with another school, is problems for me as a politician.
Swell populator. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, so when members were planning and organizing and boasting, and I will go back to what happened in View Fort, Tech Vogue was closed in View Fort and made it into a secondary school just for a particular government minister to be able to say universal secondary education was attained under my watch. Now, I will say it here. Miss Honorable Member for Castry South East, don't go, don't spread it, stretch it so far. You, you in, imputing at this present time in my in my mind some motives that may not have been in the mind of any member. Just avoid that. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I can substantiate what I'm saying. And if you're going to say that, then I will ask you to do it right now. But if you're not going to do it now, then I'm asking you to refrain from it. Mr. Speaker, I'll move on. But, no, I know what I'm saying. But Mr. Speaker, I'm guided by you on this. A number of schools were built. Now, all of the schools are underpopulated. The government has the burden to repair all of these schools. The government has the burden to repair all of these schools, to maintain all of the school plan, to maintain the employment of all of the teachers, and at the same time, we have to meet the needs of a changing sector. And so, that is the problem that we have there. You could not finish St. Jude's. You could not finish it. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'll continue on what I'm saying. If they want to have a debate on St. Jude's, I'll come on it. You never went to St. Jude's for the five years you were in government, so don't talk. But you know that. Mr. Speaker, the education sector is critical to this government. In fact, one of our campaign promises is to make it a globally competitive education system. That is our focus. We, we didn't dream that one morning. We spent five years in opposition, planning, organizing, strategizing. When we came into government, we did not have to appoint a vision commission after almost 15 years in government to tell us what to do. That is what forward thinking and forward planning does. And if that, if that had been adopted by the previous Labour administration, we would not be where we are today. We would not, this country would not be in the mess that it is today. Because all of the things we inherited, and same thing, they went and they just agreed a big loop. So if we say we need to streamline, you need to decide what is the top priority for now. Because the fact of the matter is there are lots of priorities that we cannot address at this point in time. It is not that we don't want to. The reality is you cannot do everything you want to do because the resources are not available. Now, that is prudence in governance because we have a government on this side who's responsible. We don't give dates that we cannot keep. We don't promise people what we cannot deliver. Some promised jobs, 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 and all the jobs that was happening were people were losing their jobs. We have a responsibility towards the young people of this country, towards the children. And I heard the member for View Fort South speak about special education needs and what is going on. Special education needs did not arise yesterday morning. 
and you had 15 years in government. Show us what you did. Mm -hmm. Tell me I did this, I did that, I did the other. And I would expect you to do that to continue. He said what he did? That look, no matter was where it, where it is. So, so, you put land aside, the government land you put aside is your land. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, people must come to realize that they can talk, but some people can work. And I mean, I, I listened to the member for Viewfort South in, in, in his presentation and the way he maneuvered around the information that he wants to give about his level of concern and everything. And, and I'm saying, but I'm trying to figure out what happened during the 15 years as a past educator himself to meet the needs of these people. Because if I'm going to speak about something, and he's not me. He's not me. If I want to do something, I have to go to the prime minister to get permission to do it. But he was the prime minister. He was the minister of finance. He had all the say to influence the process of education to go in a particular direction. And today, I know that I'm serving on the Prime Minister who knows that this education system needs improvement. We need improvement in school plant. We need, we need improvement in the curriculum. And you heard the Minister of Education was very clear. The Minister of Education was very clear on the training component of this. It is not just about building school plan. That is the problem, Mr. Speaker. All they're concerned about is they build schools. So ask him. And you know what they claim to fame is on St. Jude, Mr. Speaker? They were working every day. They never stopped the work. But you never stop the work, but you never accomplish anything. So what's the point of, of saying you're working, but you're not accomplishing anything? If I work on St. Jude's for two years, and I cannot finish St. Jude, I should be fired from government. Mm -hmm. That is what should happen to me. If I work for two years, and I cannot solve it, I should not be where I am. You see, Mr. Speaker, some of us hold ourselves up to a certain standard. Some other people have no standards. So, now they can say to us, do this, because you know we can do it. I know you are disappointed, because we can do it and we've not done it. So, Mr. Speaker, the plan by the Ministry of Education, as outlined, this is a visionary leader, and you have to follow the trend on the other side. All of a sudden, Dr. Robert Lewis did this, and Dr. Robert Lewis did that, former Minister of Education. Where is he? Now? Where is he? he what, what, what did he accomplish he, 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 for the education know. sector? Show me what happened in the education sector under his watch. Because, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't want to claim things that I didn't do. I didn't I don't want to claim nothing that I didn't do. All of people want to claim things. If I want to talk about the equip project, I can tell you that start this discussion started way back. But that's irrelevant. That is irrelevant because the irrelevance of it has to do with you talk about it, but you couldn't do it. That's the difference. They can talk, oh, we started it. So many people start a race. How many of them can finish the race? Are you counted when you, you, you counted for starting or for finishing? This Labour Party has never been able to finish anything they have started. They got things, 
90% complete, and when they finished with it, it was 50% complete. I don't know. I don't know how to describe what they do, Mr. Speaker. So you think, so you think I want to, I want these men, Mr. Speaker, to be in charge of what is happening in this country? Mr. Speaker, education is in good hands. It is in the hands of somebody who understands the changing trends in the education sector globally. Not somebody who is stuck in the stone age. And, and Mr. Speaker, the decisions that we have to make as a government, these are tough decisions. So you think it was easy going and look at the equip project and being able to say, look here, this is what we can afford to do. It's tough. No, we cannot do all what we want to do. We can only do what we can afford because we gave certain commitments to the people of this country that we are going to be prudent managers of this economy. You see, you see, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to say to the people of St. Lucia that as we see what is happening with our schools, with the school population, all of us as members of parliament will come under some pressure at some point in time. Because if something does not happen to change the present projections, we are going to have more problems in the future in terms of the population and in terms of the number of children in schools. So whether we want to accept it as members of parliament because it influences our votes in one way or the other, it is a matter that must be addressed. And that is why I'm saying we cannot continue to put patches on the problem. There must be a holistic approach towards reviving this education sector. We have to, whether we want to or not. So when the time comes for all of us to have that discussion, we should have it. And members opposite, I realize that they have given their support to the, the loan, and that is commendable. Your thing? Your thing? <laughs> he said that's his, Mr. Speaker, but I, I, I understand. The car... The cows were not his, but the school is his. He was Minister of Agriculture. He don't know about the cows, but he know about the schools. He was not Minister of Education. That's right. Bexon. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the people that some people can talk and some people can work. And I am convinced that the direction that we are going as a government, as an education, especially in the education sector, this is one of the pillars on which we were elected. It is in our manifesto. It is in the mission, vision, and values of the United Workers' Party. And all those who are making noise on the other side, there, ask them under which government they were educated. Ask all of them sitting on the other side there, under which government they were educated. They were educated under the government of the United Workers' Party. And, and, and you know, I'd even forgotten that, but a good thing you remind me. After, during adult suffrage, from 1951 to 1964, 19, well, but that's the point. But you see, it is how you can interpret the history that you read. <laughs> if, if the late Sir George Charles was the one in government between 1951 and 1964, 
because the UWP was not born before 1964. So who was supposed to build a secondary school in the early 60s? You, you know, Mr. Speaker, because some people come to this honorable house and they figure out that people are not knowledgeable about certain things and they talk about, they talk about we don't know what the truth is. So after adults, during the period after adult suffrage, 1951 to 1964, who was in charge of the affairs of this country? Okay? So, but if labor was in office, obviously labor had to build a school. How could UWP build a school when UWP did not exist in those days? So, so what is the claim? And UWP build no schools. Castro's Comprehensive School was not built. Leon Hess Secondary was not built. Entrepot Secondary was not built. They just, Corinne Secondary. All these schools fell from the sky. All these schools fell from the sky, Mr. Speaker, and they landed here. Nobody built them. Nobody built schools other than the Labor Party. So, Labor Party was in office for two years between 1964 and 1997, two and a half years. So I would assume that every school that is in St. Lucia was built between 1970, from 1964 to 1997. Every school that was built in St. Lucia was built in the two and a half years of the worst, most chaotic period in governance in St. Lucia. So Mr. Speaker, when members opposite want to mislead the people of this country and make them believe that everything that exists existed through them. You know what? When you can claim what is not yours, Mr. Speaker, you can do anything. When you can take credit for things you did not do, it tells me the quality of the persons that we are talking about. Don't let my MBA bother you. No. Your PhD don't bother me. Because <laughs> if I had to have a PhD, I'd be Honorable. like you. I'd rather have a Hon no HD. Honorable <laughs> member, stay focused. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to say to honorable members, and to the people of St. Lucia. We are focused and we are going to deliver on the promises that we made in our manifesto to bring world-class education to St. Lucia. We are on the path to doing so. St. Lucia is a renowned place for bright people. Yes, they have bright people, but they have some that just don't shine. <laughs> so maybe he falls in the category of those who don't shine. <laughs> but we are known for producing bright people. And I am proud to stand in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, there are opportunities for all. Some people believe, Mr. Speaker, because they got opportunities and they attained that nobody else has entitlement to this. But I stand here as an example to other young people who are marginalized, who are challenged, who had difficulties to rise to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And even today, I stand in this honorable house and they always take swipes at me, Mr. Speaker. They, they always take swipes at me. I cannot read. I cannot see. I cannot do this. I cannot do that. You, you've heard them? Um, who did the courses for me? But, but that is what it comes to. But you don't question their qualifications and their credibility. But I can question their performance because I can see they are non-performers. <laughs> And so, Mr. Speaker, if we're speaking about education, if I could attain, every young St. Lucian has an opportunity to attain. Okay? And we must never allow people to stand in our way 
of meeting what we are set to achieve in life. And so I believe in education. I believe in education more than what I say. You know why? Because I can challenge anybody on the opposite side that I have invested more in education of my personal resources to help young people go to school and do all kinds of things. When you all call me a bus driver, you know what? Most of the children traveled on my bus free of charge when they could not afford to pay to school. That's the difference. <laughs> That's what you all call me. But I've, I've been proud of who I have been. But education, education, oh, now is boasting. Honorable member, please remain focused and... Mr. Speaker, I want to assure you that this government is going to deliver on the issue of education. And the, the project that is envisaged with the EQUIP project is just one step. That is not the solution. That is not going to resolve all of the problems that we have in the education system. But it is one step in the right direction. And this government has committed more money to be spent in the education sector than the Labour Party did during their terms in office. Go to the budget. Go to the budget. So, Mr. Speaker, I support the move being made. I support the Prime Minister and the Minister of Education. And I know that we are going to deliver. We are not delivering substandard. And I'll close on this point. The Chouzel Secondary School. Ask them what we inherited when we came in here. Ask them how many years there was a report saying that this school was not fit to be used for educating children because of the risk factors involved. For how many years they were in government? Were they able to resolve the problem? They were not able to resolve the problem. We had negotiated the loan. They want to talk about loan negotiations. We had negotiated funding from the World Bank for this. When we left office in 2011, they spent five years in office. Five years. Just like St. Jude's and all other projects. They could not even get the project started. It had to take a UWP government to come back into office and to start and we are on, on target to complete the Schwarzel Secondary School, the two blocks. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. Ask them who started the Schwarzel Secondary School. You tell me what project. Exactly. Who started the process of DVRP? <laughs> DVRP process was started after Hurricane Thomas under the United Workers Party government. So, Mr. Speaker, you see, I don't play on these things, Mr. Speaker. They want to claim. Take it. Take it. You... You had the money, you couldn't finish anything. Well, I'm doing what you could not do. This UWP government is delivering on the things that the Labour Party could not deliver for five years in office. And so, Mr. Speaker, I know that we are going to accomplish what we have set to accomplish. And this country is in the best hands that it can be at this point in time, under the hands and the control of the United Workers' Party in government. I thank you. Member for Labry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to add my voice to the debate on the motion to borrow $16,192,000 U.S. from the Caribbean Development Bank for the purpose of financing the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project. 
Because, Mr. Speaker, education is one of the basic needs for human development and to escape poverty. Sir Arthur Lewis said it beautifully when he said that the cure for poverty is not money, but education. A view which has been reinforced by the late Bob Marley, who said, some people are so poor, all they have is money. The late Bob Marley said that some people are so poor, all they have is money. So, Mr. Speaker, education is necessary for national development and for a prosperous society. Education allows workforces to be more efficient, it keeps inflation at bay, and it feeds economic growth. Government and society, therefore, have a vested interest in ensuring a constant flow of students in higher education. It is urgent to ensure good quality of higher education for society's own interest, Mr. Speaker. Seminal figures in the field of education and public policy have always argued that education is so important that you must deep into your national resources to ensure that you educate your people. Because that's the only way we are going to make strides as a nation. Russia mounted from the status of underdeveloped poor country to a superpower and developed country mainly on the wings of education. Japan owes its phenomenal growth as an industrial power to education. And there is no doubt in my mind, Mr. Speaker, that the Labour Party, whether in opposition or in government, will always be committed to quality education and quality health care. We have always made education and health care urgent priorities. And a casual glance at history will provide evidence to substantiate this claim. Mr. Speaker, I noted during our debate on the estimates as well as the appropriation bill. And for the sake of clarity, I want to, of course, revisit just a portion of what I said on the whole issue of education to find a ready compass in which to set my course. I noted on that occasion, Mr. Speaker, it is well recognized that a skilled workforce is a necessary incentive for attracting foreign direct investment and making St. Lucia more competitive. The skill endowments of the labor force are indispensable for learning, technology absorption, productivity, improvement, diversification, and overall competitiveness. Investors have also cited skill availability to be a critical factor in their investment decisions. Mr. Speaker, on page 146, of the 2005 World Bank publication, it noted, and I quote, the returns on education in the Caribbean are significant, especially at the post-secondary education level, has a return of 21%. The return to education depends primarily upon the quality and quantity of supply in comparison to demand. The high returns indicate that education is a scarce factor of production and that firms are willing to pay a substantially higher wage for well-educated workers." Unquote. It went on to say on that same page, Mr. Speaker, that the variation of returns to education within the Caribbean can be related to the variation in supply of skills. Three examples. Barbados, whose successful education system is able to produce high quality Supply of skills provides high quality workers with relatively low returns, thereby contributing to increased competitiveness of Barbadian firms. Two, the low supply of workers with secondary education in the Dominican Republic has led to high returns to workers at this educational attainment level, 7% compared to 3% in Barbados. And three, low production of tertiary graduates in the OECS countries has driven up the returns to education at this level. Example, 22% in St. Lucia, resulting in very high labor costs for firms." Unquote. 
Mr. Speaker, a table on that same page showing private returns to education in the Caribbean by country, market surveys show that in the countries depicted, Barbados, Dominican Republic, Guyana, St. Lucia, Trinidad, and Tobago, was St. Lucia was the worst performer in terms of competitiveness. This is why, Mr. Speaker, between 1997 and 2006, the Labour Party felt it necessary to end the shift system in our schools. Most of our young people, they ended the secondary, their primary school life in standard four. They did not have an opportunity to go to a secondary school. And so it made return to education very high and were less competitive at that particular point in time. However, we work assiduously to, towards ensuring that we had universal secondary education in this country. We expanded existing secondary schools and we built new secondary schools. And today, we are more competitive at that level. But Mr. Speaker, we didn't get there by accident. It was a deliberate priority of my government. Many poor persons could not go to school. Poverty was a bar to learning. The Labour Party said learning must offer an escape from poverty. And so through social transformation, we started to assist our families in St. Lucia to ensure that every child has an opportunity to access a secondary school. So they were assisted with uniforms, they were assisted with books, they were assisted with transportation, they were assisted in a holistic way to ensure that they had a secondary education. We provided scholarships, we provided bursaries for the sons and daughters of toil, Mr. Speaker. And so members opposite from time to time would come with some kind of strange logic about we don't care about young people, we want people to be dependent on us. We empower people by educating them to give them an opportunity to become professionals. And this is why today, Mr. Speaker, we can boast that we can get a variety of opinions. Because across society, both north and south, we have destroyed privilege. We have equalized opportunity for the sons and daughters of St. Lucia. We have destroyed privilege, and we have equalized opportunity. And give every son and daughter the opportunity to take the place responsibly beside others in our society and contribute to national growth and development. At this juncture, I had a member for Castle Southeast spoke about MBA. And I want to, in a very sincere way, offer my congratulations to the honorable member for, from Castle Southeast. I am proud of you for recognizing the importance of education. I, I saw you speaking there with some newfound freedom. I, I heard you speaking on and, you know, unencumbered by fear, with authority. I heard you a few more months ago talking about consumption, about India and Japan. I welcome that, honorable member. I welcome that. Earlier, on the announcements. So what do you not welcome? What I, what I do not welcome. There's a book that I read about straight and crooked thinking. And the honorable member is skilled in the manipulation of falsehood. And will take facts sometimes. And of course, from some kind of misleading linear progression. He shaped it into his own image and likeness on the announcements. He spoke about St. Jude's. And of course, yes, on the, on the statements by ministers, the member for Viewford South raised a very significant point about public health. And all of that will have to contribute to the quality of education. Many persons are very concerned about the quality of education vis-a-vis -vis the quality of healthcare in our country. They go hand in hand. The health of the nation 
is the wealth of the nation. If you're not healthy, you cannot study in a way to achieve and to excel as you'd like to if you're a healthy being. And therefore, St. Jude's cannot be a trivial matter. Now, May is reading month. Reading month. And I heard the member for Castle South East reading from a document during a statement which was made a document of the House about the whole issue about St. Jude's. And I beg leave, Mr. Speaker, whilst I discuss the quality of education, to read from that same document. That very document he stated, talk about the initial plans about St. Jude's, to have St. Jude's, the people return to the, to the burn structure. Two years later, on September 9, 2011, and they would build a new hospital at Beausejou. They promised that the people would be back by 9th of September 2011. In August of 2011, Prime Minister King at the time, the member for Kasri's North, said no, they are going to, to remain at the site. And so a new scope of works came into being. Prior to the Labour Party, we had an individual dealing with the reconstruction of St. Jude's Hospital. We had a consultant engineer dealing with the hospital. We had a committee from health, from budget office, from economic planning, dealing with the reconstruction of the hospital in consonance with the CEO of St. Jude's. The CEO at St. Jude's has its own committee to ensure that the flow and everything were appropriate. The members opposite were crying out, finish St. Jude's, finish St. Jude's. Even now, they are saying we should have finished St. Jude's. Now, by saying that we should have finished St. Jude's, inherent in that statement is a clear acknowledgement that St. Jude's needs to be finished. And I want to, of course, he went through a list of contracts. Honorable Member for Larry, I will not try to stop your, but what I will say to you, remember what we discussed. Certainly, I have made that nexus. And therefore, the, the statement by the member is not open for debate. I will not tell you don't make mention of the statement, but you need to tie the two. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I believe that I made a clear nexus between health and education. Oh, you made the statement. Yes, I heard it. Yes, I, I heard want it. you to con make, continue moving the two. Okay. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, sometimes, sometimes when you're navigating and you're confronted with clear air turbulence sometimes. You have to divert. So I was engaged in a logical digression, Mr. Speaker. But this is your chamber, Mr. Speaker. This is your chamber. And so I will be obedient. I don't want to be recalcitrant in this chamber. But just to add and to conclude on the St. Jude's matter, to indicate that most of the contracts dealing with that facility that's important for school children, that the contractor they appointed until 20, December 2013, at that point, according to the financials of dealing with that hospital, $50,150,385.90 were already spent at that point. And the total during our time was $98.4 million. So he was trying to make this house a victim of misleading information, and by extension, the general public. But of course, on another occasion, Mr. Speaker, we will continue that debate about St. Jude's, only to say okay. that based on the urgency of the situation, this government has absolutely no alternative but to complete the St. Jude's Hospital. It seemed as if nothing is a priority in the South for this UWP administration. 
They come, take our lands and give it away. And they cannot even build a few classrooms to accommodate from one students. They cannot build a few, a few classrooms at Binfield to put the students. So all we want to do is come, must depend on the people of Euphort, take their lands to make a petty bourgeois enclave that will not generate any jobs for the people of, of the South, that will not fix up the school plant, that will not improve the quality of education, and it's okay. They expect the opposition to just remain silent. To just remain silent. You see, the contents take the shape of the container. And the container is a horse. Everything in this country is now subordinated into the supreme interest of some horse business. And this is the problem, Mr. Speaker. The government has sufficient time to erect a structure at Binfield to accommodate the children that they are asking today to go and apply for other schools. You know how stressful that is? When young children are studying, looking forward to going to Binfield, they are dreaming about the place at Binfield, the seat at Binfield. And you come during the time that they are preparing for the exam. You introduce this kind of trauma in their life. And then you come here and pretend as if you're so concerned about young people. During our NYC days, we always said that education is a right, not a privilege. And the member for Cassie South, who was an active participant in the process, could attest to the veracity of this declaration. We emerge out of the need to educate our young people so that they can provide leadership and take our country to a new plane of development. But we cannot take our country to a new plane if we are not serious about addressing the quality of education in our country. And you know what? The amazing thing is they laugh. They laugh. They laugh at the rights of humanity. They laugh at the people of Euphort. And when they are called to consult with the people, what they do? They announce some town hall meeting. And when people get there, it's actually a constituency group meeting, throwing people out, deleting the things from their, from their phones, as if, you know, somehow that the business of the country is a secret. And then they organize an open day for their supporters to go to try to distort the reality of things. And, and we organize a rally, they run to Lacouville and tell the people all sorts of <laughs> truth, eh? We'll see. I'll tell you, whilst the people of Miku have a tradition of voting for a particular party, the people are, edu are educating themselves. And even though they support the party, they can make a distinction between what is true and what is not true. And they, they went to Lacouville, and they could not advance logical and cogent arguments to substantiate any of the things that they were saying. Just imagine, in the process of coming into office, they have called us all types of names. They have called us niggers. They have called us dogs. They, they call us terrorists. No. Honorable leader. No. And only recently, Mr. Speaker. Honorable, I, honorable member. Recently, honorable member. Honorable only member. Recently, only honorable recently. members. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Hey, members, 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 members. Members. I remember for library. I can. <laughs> Honorable members, please. Honorable member for Viewfort South and Honorable member for. Member for library. Use some very strong words that I believe that you should not. Have. I, I, I wasn't the one who came up with it, yeah, but then you're the one saying it now, yes, and I'm not. 
I am not taking an issue with what you what may have been, but when you stand here and you see that persons call you dogs and all kind of um, just be it is moving into unparliamentary language now because we're not supposed to we not honorable member for we're not supposed to we're not supposed to be insultive or use obscene language to other members of this house or any other house. One thing I will say, you have to speak to history. I never come to this house and try to mislead anybody. What I have said is not subject to debate or compromise. Not even the best political liar can refute anything that I have said. And Mr. Speaker, you see, Honorable Member, you can remain standing, Honorable Member, because all I want to do, I do not, in your use of whatever term you want to use, once you're making reference to fellow members here, then your language must change. But I wasn't That's the one who used I'm the language. Oh, I'm not saying it was not used or it was. Yes, I was yes, I'm saying them. once you stand there and you're using, you're using those language or these words and it may be reflective or impute Ms. on you, members here, I'm saying that I am going to step thank, in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But the point has been made. The point has been made. And even last night, whilst I was watching the news, there was another one with a white glove saying something else which i will not introduce into this honorable house you see you, you heard the you heard the prime minister you heard the prime minister you you you, you heard the prime minister is that language acceptable in this house is is that language acceptable in this house uh, Honorable members, what is the, what allow is the, the member to come. What is the nexus between a sheet of paper and toilets? What is what is the connection? What is the connection? Now I'll say something, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is your chamber, like I said, and I'm going to be guided by you. But make no mistake about it, Mr. Speaker, that I'm not one of those timid individuals. This country calls for courage. And we are not going to be cowards in the face of your attempt, uh, attempted bullying. We are not going to be intimidated by you. Who is bullying you, member? One, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this government is not committed to no quality education and no quality health care in this country. And I want to take my, my discourse on this subject to its logical conclusion by alluding to something that has been well documented. And I think the member for VFO North raised it earlier when he spoke about the laptops. What is well documented, Mr. Speaker, is that effective use of ICT is an essential ingredient for attaining competitiveness in both services and the niche manufacturing sectors in the Caribbean. Many firms have utilized ICT to cut costs, improve communications with customers, improve logistics, overcome distance, and understand their competitive positioning in order to foster an environment for greater and more effective use of ICT, policymakers would need to facilitate access, among other things. Apart from doing nothing to improve skill endowment, this government has destroyed the laptop program. Take it away from the poor people that were making use of it. On a point of order, What's I the point think of order? the honorable members misleading the listening. Well. What's the point of order? I'm not going to yield. What's the point no, of order? Honorable Wait, member for Library. She has to find it. Wait. Just hold on. She has she has indicated she's standing on a point of order. So immediately I would like you to say it. Honorable member for Miko No. Please get to the Honorable thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I have stood in this house What's on the point of order? occasions. Yes. Yeah. What's the point of order? Just turn off your light, please. Turn off all your microphones while I look. <laughs> Honorable <laughs> member I'm for... I'm by you, Mr. Yes. Mr. Speaker. Because Go ahead, I let me was hear. going to rise on 35B, which is elucidation. 
If it is that he will allow an elucidation, he does not have to yield. But 34A requires that he yields. So whichever one I can exercise, either 34A or 35B, I think it is. Very well. Then. Bri, are you yielding? But, Mr. Speaker, there is a point of elucidation I can also... Elucidation? I'm not going to yield you. to the member for Mikunov. I'm yes, by honorable you, members, Ma member for Mikunov, if, if it is a point of elucidation, he then does he does not have to yield. That's right. That. Yeah. I'm, not going to, I'm not going to... If you say a point of order, I expected you to say that I'm imputing improper motives or misleading the House. I'm not misleading, misleading the House. The house. Go I ahead, not. sir. Your mic. Thank you. When the member for, for library is speaking, you put off your mic, only the speaker has the authority to punctuate my presentation. But you see, Mr. Speaker, nobody will be fooled by this UWP administration. Everybody, everybody knows the truth. And at the end of the day, it is all well and good for you to say 40-something thousand people voted for you. But you must be sensitive to national mood. Every social partner that would speak in this country would be attacked. They are considered sectoral irritants. We cannot have peace in this country if that is going to be the attitude of the government. You, 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 are, you are not securing an environment of peace for you to introduce policy. You are just provoking people. You attack the, the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association. You attack National Trust. And I'm sure, you know, all of you talk, including the member for Grosile. You know, as I'm speaking, you all are talking. You all are all afraid. You all know better. You all know better. But you see, there is something called identification with the aggressor in psychology. And I'm going to end with that. Where, in order to try to repress what is causing anxiety, some people can identify with people who have hijacked them. So you all are all there. You all know what is right. But, you know, you all just have to clap and, you know, pretend that what we are saying there does not make sense and it's not the truth. But tato, tato. Tato, tato, bola me pa loin. Bola me pa loin. This year, we are going to be midway very soon. And you'll have to account to the people of this country. No matter how big we think we are, no matter how powerful we think we are, in an instant, God will take charge. And I believe in God. That's why I fear no man. And I will speak my truth in this house and in my country of birth. I was born here. I was cooked and baked in this culture. I understand my people, and I will always give my people the best possible representation. So, Mr. Speaker, again, given the fact that we are committed to quality education, we have no difficulty, Mr. Speaker, in embracing this particular borrowing and to support the motion to borrow to improve quality. But of course, the quality of health care must equally be addressed, Mr. Speaker, and I want the member for Castries Southeast and the Prime Minister to finish our hospital so that when the kids fall sick at the various institutions, they have a proper hospital to go to. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy that um, this bill has evoked this kind of debate. Because education is something that's incredibly important to the future of St. Lucia. And you know, it's a, a, we, can ask, we can ask ourselves, Sorry? Yes? Is that okay? 
No, I mean. No. It's no, a, no, it's a finance. Okay. But if it, it, am I, do, do you want me to sit back down and somebody else want to speak? Okay. So. That's your mantra for the day. Education <laughs> is incredibly important, Mr. Speaker. I say education is very important because I think that in listening to debate on both sides, one of the things that's very, very clear is that we do not have an education system currently in St. Lucia that any of us have confidence in that's going to take us to the next level. Really. Okay. So the other side, Madam Speak Ms. Mr. Speaker, is saying, no, no, is saying, is saying, I want to take the opposite then. Are you saying that, in fact, the education system in St. Lucia is working fine? So I would, I, I, would, I, would, I would then rephrase, Mr. Speaker, what I said. Both sides agree that our education system currently in its state okay, needs improvement in order to be able to deliver to the people of St. Lucia what it needs to be. Okay? And to date, it has not done so. And the question becomes, Mr. Speaker, how do we do that? Education for the longest time has been the number one expenditure mm -hmm. that we've had. In fact, this year, Mr. Speaker, if my memory serves me correct, I believe the number is about $182 million. Less. We're spending less. But in, nine, in 2001, we spent $90 million. And in 2001, when we spent the $90 million, you had 40,000 students. Today, you have 27,000 students. And the question becomes, in, 19, in 2001, we were spending $2,275 per child. Today, we're spending $6,700 per child. Has the level of quality of education increased by threefold? Can we say that? Can we, can we honestly say, Mr. Speaker, that we've had a 300% improvement in the level of education? You know, Mr. Speaker, the, the, worst sin, the worst sin to have is when one cannot even be honest with themselves. When the, government, when the former government was in office and they started a new hotel, of which, of, which, of which they have said that we have never acknowledged that they were the ones who started the hotel. And I want to say it again publicly, what I said at the opening ceremony that I want to acknowledge the work that the Labour Party did in bringing royalty into St. Lucia. And I want to acknowledge how brave they were in doing some of the bold initiatives in order to make sure that that project came on. I said it. I said it. I said it on the opening of the ceremony on the, of the ribbon cutting for the opening of the hotel. Okay? I've said it, but I didn't say that in the campaign. I said I supported the project. Okay? Now, can you not be honest with yourself and ask yourself the question, why? Why would we have had 44, sorry, 25% unemployment and 44% unemployment amongst the youth? And why is it that the hotel brought in 50% of the workers from abroad? Why? You had to fly the people in, you had to put them up and pay higher salaries than you were paying in St. Lucia. Okay? Yes, and you can speak to the minister, the former minister of labor. Okay, why? And that is where we must be honest of ourselves and accept some of the feelings that we're having. So where are we going? How are we going to be able to change the education system? So when we came into government, Mr. Speaker, the other side is correct. The equip project was ready to go. And the total amount was about 30 million US dollars. In fact, there was 100 million US dollars worth of loans approved with CDB, which would have increased the debt stock of St. Lucia by 10%. And the million dollar question becomes, Mr. Speaker, that we had to ask ourselves and go through each one of those loans. So yesterday, in fact, we did the groundbreaking for the dam. And in fact, that that money was going to be borrowed with a government guarantee. 
and we were able to negotiate with CDB to get them to accept just the tax. And they would get, be given a letter of comfort. And the same thing with education. When we looked at the education, if, again, my memory serves me correct, of the $30 million that was approved, $25 million was to fix up five schools. Five schools. And the question became, after spending 30 million US dollars in education, did we believe that we were going to be significantly changing the education in St. Lucia? And that's why when we renegotiated with CDB was to break the project down into two parts. And the first part was to be able to focus on a new plan for education, which includes a review of the curriculum. And that we said that we have no difficulties in spending money on maintenance of the schools. In fact, we have now borrowed money, $10 million, which is going to be spent this summer, on helping to fix up the basic needs of schools. But what we would not do is go and spend five to six million US dollars on a school and we were only fixing an old school. And we have no idea what the new school of the future is going to look like because we don't know what the curriculum is going to look like. No, yeah, no problem. And that is not what I said. So Mr. Speaker, what we have to make sure is what is education going to look like? How are we going to be able to deliver to make sure that the education system is being able to provide a globally competitive education system for the people in our country? We also said that this idea that everybody has to go to tertiary level education, because we see not enough kids going to tertiary level education, but when they come back, they're not getting jobs that they can afford to pay back the loans that they had. And in fact, many of them aren't coming back. So what we've seen, like in Switzerland, like in Germany, the apprenticeship programs and tech box schools are a better way to go. Because when a child can now do a short-term course or a year course in improving his skills, the likelihood is that he can afford to pay back that loan. And he's going to be given a skill set which is immediately going to earn him a higher wage. Because the affordability of it is not just for us as a state. The affordability also comes for the people. Because I've met many families in which the parents have agreed to mortgage their home for the children to go to university. And the kids don't come back and the bank now is knocking on the door. So we have a problem. And it's only if we are going to agree to face that problem that we're going to solve it. So when we talk about new curriculum, who doesn't believe we don't have to fix the new curriculum? The new method of measuring the quality of your education system today is critical thinking. In fact, it's replaced SAT test. And the country that continuously comes number one in the world in critical thinking is Finland, Mr. Speaker. And guess what? A novel approach that's not so novel. That in fact, in Finland, it's more difficult to become a teacher than it is to become a lawyer or a doctor. And that they are well paid. And so same, some of the same deficiencies that the member from Viewfort South so rightfully pointed out that the skill set of the teachers to be able to deal with all these different deficiencies, that they have a greater capacity to be able to do that. There's an unwritten episode that takes place. I call it the great exodus <laughs> every day at 2.30 during the week. Mothers and parents leaving work to go and pick up their children and bringing them back where? Right back to their workplace. When do we have traffic jams in this country? Because all the parents are rushing to bring their kids to school in the morning. We can't even put in a proper transportation system to be able to deal with that. How are we going to solve those problems? If we look at what UNESCO says we ought to be spending on education, we're not even coming close to that number, to meet the, the minimum level. And we all recognize that in order for us to be competitive, 
that we have to have students at even a higher level. So if the current structure cannot fulfill the needs of St. Lucia, why are we scared to make a change? And what is that change? And how are we going to have that discussion? And you're 100% right. Can't have that discussion amongst ourselves. We have to now reach out to the business community. We have to reach out to all the different NGOs, all the people who are employing people in this country, and find out what that skill set that we have to get, and how are we going to make sure that our curriculum is able to meet that need. You know, the members from the other side keep on pounding away at the idea that these laptops have disappeared. So you gave kids laptops in order to be able to access the internet, but there was no curriculum on the laptop, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely none. I would love you to say that Finland is a bad example. Okay, go ahead. Oh. So we're, 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 you, have a government, you have a government that was in office for 15 years and they're saying the people are still enslaved. I don't understand. But you see, this is the difficulty I have, Mr. Speaker. My member, my, the member, the honorable member from Labry keeps on saying on the other side, finish the hospital. I want to know that for the five years that he was in government, when he passed by the hospital every day, how come he did not go to cabinet every week and say, finish the hospital. Why all of a sudden now? Why all of a sudden now? This great need to finish the hospital. And the fact is, is that we want to finish the hospital in order to improve the quality of health care for the people in this country. They were interested in finishing the hospital for political gain. They could do nothing. They cannot. They're asking people to do what themselves could not do, Mr. Speaker. And that is, and you know, that is the greatest level of, of honorable members. Honorable member for library. Honorable member. Honorable members. Honorable members. It appears. It appears. Honorable member for library. It appears, Mr. Prime Minister, I may have to direct you not to use the word St. Jude. Because whenever the word St. Jude is used, it seems like it brings out. <laughs> Just continue, Mr. Prime Minister, but I need. This is, this, Mr. Speaker, it's amazing to me that people who have such a failed track record would be so brave and brazen to try to hold other people accountable when they could not even hold themselves accountable. There are so many examples of things in which they promised and they could not deliver. And yet now, but rightfully so, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, the expectation on the other side is that we are going to deliver. And we will deliver. You know, I, I'm, I'm also very confused, Mr. Speaker, because when I make the statement that we accept that the education system has failed us, when you have the leader of the, of the, of the party, the honorable member from Viewfort South, who said, what was it, 73% of the workforce was not qualified. What does that say? What does that acknowledgement say? That we have an education system in which it just needs some tinkering? Or we have an education system that has completely failed the people of this country? When I meet young people today, and I meet so many of them, who are discouraged, disenchanted, and unmotivated to go to school. Look at Sir Arthur Lewis College. Physically, curriculum. Can we say that it's delivering to the people of this country? But guess what? The members on this side, Mr. Speaker, acknowledge the challenge that we have. We do not play the blame game. All we are committed to do, Mr. Speaker, is to fix it. Exactly. Is to make yeah. it better. Yeah. Because we are committed to giving yeah. the people of this country the freedom that they so richly deserve. Yeah. And that freedom comes in the ability to be able to pay for their own health care services. The ability to get a best education system, yeah. an education system that's not only competitive in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, but when they travel abroad, they can compete with the best nurses in the world. They compete with the best lawyers, the best doctors, the best accountants. Exactly. That is who we're looking for. Yeah. We look to celebrate in the excellence of St. Lucia's, Mr. Speaker. The same Ojo Labs. So on one hand, the member on the other side is talking about laptops 
and the need for technology, we bring a company to St. Lucia, Ojo Labs, which is now transferring, transferring incredible skill sets to the people of St. Lucia in the area of coding, and that we have now a young St. Lucia, a young St. Lucia who went into that program, sir, and guess what he did? Within two months, looked at the overall program, was able to make a contribution and improve the productivity of the business. You know what that tells us, Mr. Mr. Speaker? There are many more St. Lucians who have that skill set. And what we want to do is we want to develop that skill set. We want to introduce coding at high school level and coding for afterwards in order to make this thing happen. What we're doing in, in village tourism, Mr. Speaker, in terms of helping entrepreneurs develop in St. Lucia, because we have confidence in the people of St. Lucia, and we understand the responsibility that we have, Mr. Speaker, in delivering to the people of St. Lucia. So today, of the $182 million that we're spending in education now, 61% of it is in the form of salaries. And here's the reality. They're not getting paid enough. I listen to members on the other side who said I've ridiculed teachers. I've never ridiculed teachers. I celebrate teachers in this country. I hold them up in the highest esteem. The highest esteem. And what I've said is that they're not being paid enough. And in addition to that, we have to be able to provide them with better education. They should be paid more. Because we have to fix the economy. And right now, St. Lucia continues to, run, uh, to operate in a deficit. You said it yourself. And so those are the things that we have to be able to fix. We have to grow this economy in order to be able to generate the revenues to be able to put into education, to put into healthcare, and to put into the infrastructure. But guess what? I don't expect the members on the other side to understand that because every time there is a financial problem in this country, they only know how to do one thing, Mr. Speaker, and it's to put taxes in. That's all they know how to do. Put one tax on top of another tax. So when we came in, when we came in, and we said that we were going to move the taxes off the VAT. They said it was impossible. Honorable. So when, Honor you now, when you now move, when you move. Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister and members. Honorable members. Honorable members. <laughs> Honorable members. I'm not hearing, the, I'm not hearing the member. You wouldn't know the truth. You were navigating all over the too high. Honorable member for Grosile, Honorable member for Labre, Mikudnov, allow the Prime Minister, uh, at least allow him to speak in order that I may hear what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Okay then. Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I keep on saying to my, my friend and, and um, the member from Labre that he keeps flying too high. That's why he wouldn't be able to see the truth. There must, be, there must be clearly something wrong with his navigational system. And every day when he was coming up, when he had to be picked up in, in the morning and dropped off in the evening, clearly he never passed by St. Jude to understand that the, ho the hospital needed to be open. It's amazing to me, Mr. Speaker, that members on the other side who have now accounting to see that they're going to, they've spent how much? $118 million and counting, and that it's not even 50% completed. I would be ashamed and embarrassed if that happened. That is the greatest, that is the greatest horror that has taken place in this country. And during while they were doing that, to leave the people in the stadium in the conditions they are, and now want to come and talk about that, that the people's lives are being, are being jeopardized. Can you imagine? Amazing, Mr. Speaker. And he's talking about, he's a person who's talking about putting a filing a navigational plan. Where was the navigational plan for St. Jude's? <laughs> So in fact, if anything, we've taken your advice and we're filing a new flight plan in order to be able to arrive at the destination because the flight plan that you have was just going in the air. I've told the member from, from View from, from Labry continuously, there's a big difference between spending money and working. They were not, they were not working. They were just spending money. Spending money. Spending money. Okay, and at least on this side, we're going to be accountable to the people of St. Lucia as to how much money we're going to spend. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker. Yes, now. Honorable members. Honorable members. 
I have said to you, I have no issue. I have said that before. I have no issue with the cross stuff. I have none whatsoever. But it's getting too loud. <laughs> it is getting too loud. I'm wondering now if the recording or if the general public out there is actually hearing what is being said and maybe hearing the, the cross talk. Member for Grossly, uh, you have been warned through me by the member of library. <laughs> Continue, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you, sir. You know, members on the other side, Mr. Speaker, always continuously um, create stories for their own satisfaction. I heard some of these adjectives that were used to describe how we describe the Labour Party. I want to say categorically, I know of no one who ever used that kind of language to describe because you know what? They did a good enough job of destroying themselves. Nobody had, nobody had to criticize them, Mr. Speaker. But I want to say this to you. When we talk about victimization, when you get into, when you get into office, right? You want another clear example? The same former Minister of Education, where is he working today? Where is he working today? He's working at Sir Arthur. Okay. So he never worked at Sir Arthur. But I want to know. I want to know that the the present, the current Minister of Education, when she was in opposition, was she ever afforded that opportunity to work for any of the institutions in Saint Lucia? A person who had who had taught at UWE, who had made applications to to to, to work, and never happened. And you see, that's the, that's the difference between one, one government and the other government. He, he certainly has worked at Sir Arthur Lewis while in opposition. Okay. So, Mr. Speaker, one of the things is, is that one of the things that we've really learned to do very well on this side is to recognize it is the objective of the opposition to oppose. But I have to say to you, Mr. Speaker, it is the objective of the party in government to govern and govern, govern we shall. And that this project that we have approved here today, and I'm very grateful for the support from the opposition, very grateful, that this project is the beginning of transforming our education yes. system. And that is what our intention is to do. And there are many more announcements to come, Mr. Speaker, in very short time, that will show the people of St. Lucia where we're going. You're working. And I can congratulate all the members on my side. We heard a report today on how well we're doing in tourism. We've heard what we're doing now with Wasco, a project that couldn't get off the ground, that again, suffered from labor pains and couldn't get off the ground. But I say to you, Mr. Speaker, I'm very grateful today to the CDB for working with us on making the amendments to this project and, and agreeing to phase this project. I'm very much looking forward to the technical work that's going to be done. But I didn't want to sit down, Mr. Speaker, without at least acknowledging very importantly, the contribution that the member from Viewfort South gave, particularly about special needs. This is an area in which we have to address and pay more attention to. When we hear the plight of the School of the Blind and the Donata School and many of our other other schools, it is something that we're committed to do. And I'm very happy that in this project, there are funds to be able to develop that. So the first phase is about helping with the programming. And the second phase is about helping now with the physical uh, infrastructure to be able to support those types of entities. So again, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow US 16,192,000 from the Caribbean Development Bank for the purposes of financing the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project. And be it further resolved that A, in case of the special funds resources portion, one, the loan is repayable in 80 equal and approximately equal and consecutive quarter, quarterly installments on, on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement or on such later due date as the bank may specify in writing, and two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5% per annum withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the special funds resources portion. B, 
in the case of the ordinary capital resources portion, one, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly, quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of, the, of five years following the date of the loan agreement or on such a later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank may specify in writing. Two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.97% per annum withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion and free, a commitment charge at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion on withdrawn and with accrues and which accrues from the 60th day following the date of the loan. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Bills. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the first reading of a bill shortly entitled St. Lucia Tourism Authority Amendment Bill. St. Lucia Tourism Authority Amendment. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order number 482 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable, honorable members, the question is that standing order number 482 be suspended in order to allow the honorable minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I know put the question, as many as are of that opinion, see I? As many as of a country opinion, you know, I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Leave is granted. Proceed, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I also beg for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled St. Lucia Tourism Authority Amendment. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that the ever changing tourism environment is becoming increasingly competitive. And, Mr. Speaker, this demands that small jurisdictions like St. Lucia with very limited budgets when compared to jurisdictions like the other destinations in the Caribbean with bigger room stocks and bigger capacity, Mr. Speaker, that we have the very best institutional arrangements to govern the marketing of the destination. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the changes which we have made in the last two years, uh, i.e. being one, the reduction in the administrative budget as outlined in my statement this morning, which clearly pointed out to the fact that we reduced the administrative budget from 10 million to uh, 4 million. Mr. Speaker, in order to enable us to better finance the visibility of the destination. Mr. Speaker, other moves to also uh, rid the bo board of events so that we would have a lot more money towards uh, increasing the visibility uh, of the destination, Mr. Speaker, is indeed very imperative. Mr. Speaker, the amendments which we seek to make to the bill today is in keeping with that broader objective. And so, Mr. Speaker, as we seek to amend section seven of the bill, uh, which in section 2C, which currently reads uh, in the primary act that uh, three persons be nominated by the hotel and tourism associations must be appointed by the board of directors uh, by the minister in writing. Um, Mr. Speaker, what we seek to do now is to expand the pool from which we can select persons in the board. And so, Mr. Speaker, the clear intention uh, with this amendment is to also now allow us to include uh, other trade associations, such as the Chamber of Commerce and the Manufacturing Association. 
Mr. Speaker, this will widen the pool um, of individuals from which we can choose from and leverage the wealth of um, expertise and intelligence that exist in a number of our trade associations. What this will also do, Mr. Speaker, is create a better engagement between tourism and its relevant stakeholders. Very often, uh, you find that there's a disconnect and there's not an acute understanding in the other sectors as to the difficulties, the challenges, the opportunities even that the tourism sector may face from time to time. And, th and this, Mr. Speaker, um, have oftentimes caused a lot of conflict. And so, Mr. Speaker, the amendment here will create a better engagement and a more cohesive existence between tourism and a number of its uh, stakeholder sectors. Mr. Speaker, the bill also, the amendment also allow, allow us to depoliticize the uh, board because, Mr. Speaker, it is still in keeping with the primary act where uh, we do um, have a situation whereby the government will appoint four out of seven members. Mr. Speaker, this is a change from the old St. Lucia Tourist Board Act, whereby the minister appointed all 12 of the members. And what you found, Mr. Speaker, were uh, invariably ministers uh, may sometimes oversaddle the board uh, with, with political appointments uh, that may tend to, Mr. Speaker, um, hinder the board from having the best resources on it. And so, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is in keeping uh, with that broader intent. Mr. Speaker, um, we also seek to exempt um, the authority from paying of duties and taxes, and that is by the insertion of a new clause, Mr. Speaker, into the bill. And, and so, Mr. Speaker, uh, the bill now will become sort of a, the, the board will now become a duty-free entity whereby it will have a lot more resources to be plowed into the marketing of the destination rather than increasing and incurring additional overheads. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, two very simple and straightforward amendments um, is being proposed here, but very significant, Mr. Speaker, in the context of our development and in the context of the overall uh, role that tourism plays in the advancement of our economy. Mr. Speaker, there's also, uh, this is also in keeping with the government's broader intent to better improve the arrangements that govern tourism. And so, Mr. Speaker, you would have heard um, us made pronouncements about village tourism, which we will institute later this year, and we've reached a very advanced stage in accomplishing that. And in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are getting ready to launch the first component of the National Tourism Council, which will in bring together about 17 public and private sector agencies working together to develop tourism holistically. This will be the policy hub, while the Tourism Authority, which we seek to amend uh, the primary bill today, will be the marketing arm, while village, village tourism, Mr. Speaker, will focus on business development, entrepreneurship, and seeks to empower St. Lucians to participate at a higher level, at, a, at the entrepreneurship level, to uh, become owners of the sector rather than mere workers. And so, Mr. Speaker, a rather comprehensive view is being taken as we seek to make these rather two simple amendments to this bill, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honorable members, the question is that the St. Lucia Tourism Authority Amendment Bill be read a second time. Honorable member for Viewfort South. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Tourism Authority Act was assented to on July 26, 2017. And we are here 10 months, 11 months later, amending the very same act that we have just enacted. Now, <clears throat> I do not believe that that should be held against the government. 
for the very simple reason that in the process of enactment of legislation, it is very common that errors are committed, not picked up at the moment of enacting, enactment and have to be corrected in due course. It's a different matter, of course, if in the passage of the legislation that issues were identified to be dealt with, they were ignored, and then you come back based on those submissions and you propose then to make the mistakes, to correct the mistakes which had been pointed out earlier. But I was not present, unfortunately, when this bill was introduced to this House, so did not have a chance to offer any thoughts on the legislation. So in a sense, this affords a new opportunity to reflect on some of the provisions. At the outset, I would disavow the view that these are two simple amendments. They're not. They are not simple amendments. They have issues, they have problems, and I think that some thought has to be given to not just these amendments, but the context of the legislation. The amending bill says in clause three, that section seven of the principal act is amended in subsection two by deleting paragraph C and by substituting the following. Three must be persons nominated by primary one hotel and tourism associations and trade associations. And of course, the very language destroys the minister's argument that the intention is to depoliticize the, the process of appointment because the harsh and clear reality is that they are nomination to the minister. And if you have been nominated for appointment and the minister has a discretion whether you accept or not accept the, the nominees. But we can put that on the side for the, for the time being. The problem starts off with language. It says three must be persons nominated by primary hotel and tourism association. And that word, of course, appears in the original bill in section seven because it also speaks of primary hotel and tourism association. What, what is a primary hotel and tourism association? Who are these primary hotel and tourism associations. You search in vain in the definition section for a definition of the word primary, but you do not find it. And perhaps, Mr. Speaker, just to <clears throat> elucidate a little, a little better by using some personal experience. You know, Mr. Speaker, sometimes Parliament does things and Parliament ascribes a, mean, a meaning to what it does. But the courts may interpret what Parliament has done in a different way to what Parliament had intended. And I can tell you, it is not a very pleasant experience to appear before a judge when you are first-hand witness to passage or enactment of laws and you know what the intention of Parliament was, but a judge gives a different interpretation to what is enacted. So when we enact legislation, we have to be exceptionally careful and be clear in our minds that what we intend as lawmakers is what the courts understand and the courts apply. And so for that reason, I am not so sure that the word primary has any place. And I note with interest the inclusion of what is described as trade associations. What are, what are, what are trade associations? What are we referring to? Are we referring to organizations who use, use the word trade? I don't know, honorable member, whether you remember specific trade associations. What are we talking about? 
why the looseness and the lack of precision. I, I really want to suggest that this proposal be revisited and recast so that we identify precisely what we are trying to say. If it is that you're talking about the Hotel and Tourism Association or the Small Hotel Association, then say so. If you're talking about a trade association, what association, then say so. Otherwise, this is cast at sea and it is left rather loose. Similarly, we see in the amendment section, and I'm looking at clause three, paragraph C, it says in subsection four, by deleting the words the primary hotel and tourism associations, and by substituting the words the relevant. That is fine, because in that sense, the relevant association takes its color from um, the association named or identified before. So I, I really would want to suggest that this be revisited notwithstanding notwithstanding what um, the minister is suggesting. Then the inclusion of a clause 36A is highly debatable. It says notwithstanding a provision in any law in St. Lucia, the authority is exempt from the payment of any taxes and duties. That has always been a vexed provision because I remember we met it in Parliament when we enacted new legislation attempting to grant concessions to new hotels. This, this, this piece of legislation that I believe reference was being made to earlier on. The question here is this. When we use payment of any taxes and duties, what do we mean? Do we include VAP? Does that language include VAT, and is it intended to give an exemption for VAT as well? The reason why this is important, Mr. Speaker, is this. The people in the VAT office will tell you that it does not and cannot include VAT because VAT is a special act, and the VAT Act itself has to be amended to grant the concessions on VAT. And on reflection over the years, in fact, I'll be very honest and say, when that argument was presented to me, in the end I had accepted that argument, that the way we should have gone with that act granting new concessions was ready to go and amend about that. Somehow it fell through the cracks and was not done. So, Mr. Speaker, somehow, somehow Mr. What is it now? What he has again? And, yes, Mr. MBA, somehow it fell through the cracks. So, Mr. Speaker, I would want to suggest that that provision be re examined to minimize the potential for conflict. It may mean that Parliament may have to make the amendment effective by amending, by granting the concession specifically under the VAT legislation because of the way the VAT Act is drafted. Now, Mr. Speaker, that being said, I believe that this, uh, the opportunity should have been taken to clean up this act. And uh, there may be differences of opinion about the underlying policies and the purposes for this legislation. I think that has already been rehearsed. But there are some very serious issues lurking in this legislation that I believe should have been corrected. I draw the attention of honorable members to section 19 of the act. And it is perhaps unfortunate that the amendment act did not deal with this issue. Look at clause five. At the meeting of the board, the chairperson shall preside. Or B, if the chairperson is not present, the deputy 
chairperson shall preside, or C. If the chairperson or the deputy chairperson is not present, the directors present shall choose one of them number to preside. Seems clear. So, if a meeting is called, the chairperson presides. If the chairperson is not there, the deputy chairperson presides. If the chairperson or deputy chairperson is not present, then the directors proceed with the business and elect one of them. But then look at subsection 6. A meeting of the board is constituted if at the meeting there is the presence of the chairperson or deputy chairperson and a quorum of not less than five directors participated in the meeting. Obvious common sense. This collides frontally with the earlier subsection that I just read. And there's no escaping. Because five says, if you have a meeting, the chairperson shall preside. Chairperson absent, deputy chairperson. If both are absent, the deputies proceed to elect. And then it says, a meeting of the board is constituted if at the meeting there is a presence of the chairperson or deputy chairperson and a quorum of no less than five. So how does clause section five become operative in the face of the declaration that subsection six says that a meeting is only constituted if at the meeting there is the presence of the chairperson or deputy chairperson? Now, I suspect, I don't know, maybe the people in the Attorney General's cha um, chambers probably have a way of interpreting this and my simple mind did not get it right. But I don't understand how we can craft this this way because it seems to me that not only is it conflicting, but it causes confusion. Now, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, sorry. This bill, this act rather, has one aspect of it that is a, 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 not, un, not totally unusual. It's not uncommon these things happen. Normally, most acts will say that the minister is empowered to bring the act into force by a certain, certain date. Now, sometimes um, it may say that the minister may bring the act into force um, in parts or in sections, so different parts come into force, different sections come into force at different times. This bill, and I search it and I may be wrong, does not say when it comes into force. And the learning from the Attorney General's chambers, at least, when I was around, suggests that where a bill does not say or does not make a provision for it coming into force by a specified date of the minister, then it is to be taken that on the bill being assented, it comes into force at the time of assent. That's what I've been advised, even my Office of Parliament on this matter. It's a good opportunity if if that is not so, for that to be stated. Once we are clear then that this is the case, then we move on to the next stage. The question, therefore, is, is this authority in effect and has it successfully repealed the old Tourism Act? Now, why is this important? Mr. Speaker, the minister can correct me, he can simply tell me no, I'm wrong. It is my understanding that a board of directors has not been appointed under this act. Yes or no? No. The minister has declined to respond. That's very unusual. Very, very unusual. Now, Yes, of course, I'd love to hear him rebut. I mean, come on. If no board of directors was appointed or has been appointed, then 
who, how does the chief executive officer, whom I understand is Mrs. Agnes Francis, get her authority to act? What? Well, what position does she hold? She's chair of the whole board. Yes, but how does she get her authority to act? That becomes a question. If there is no board in place. Now, of course, the member for Ancillary Canaries was having a good day, was gloating about the tourism figures and the performance, and he was in his element this day. But I'm not going to touch that for the moment. I will leave that for more capable colleagues to do so. We shall put that on the side. I'm more interested in the legal, <laughs> I'm more interested in the legal um, dynamics of this, of this legislation. The question is, if there is no board, how then is expenditure authorized under, let us say, Section 32. Who gives the chairman of a non-existent board the authority to engage in expenditure? Now, of course, there might be an answer to what I'm raising. The minister may be able to say in his rebuttal that, look, all the expenditure is being done by the Ministry of Tourism, they're the ones directing expenditure, nothing by the tourist board. Because I would want to argue and to say that if the tourism authority engaged in expenditure, then it would have done so unlawfully because it had no authority to do so. In fact, in fact, if any expenditure was incurred by the chairperson, Mrs. Agnes Francis, and she gave instructions for that expenditure, the government may well be advised to validate those expenditures which she incurred. because they would have occurred in the absence of a board that the legislation itself had authorized. Mr. Speaker, these are some of the matters that the minister will need to clarify. And in all sincerity, well, I better don't use that word because you can't use a kind word, you know. Even a kind word is subject to criticism. I believe that the opportunity should be taken to clean up this, this act. I really believe the opportunity should be taken to clean up this act. To come back to Parliament, resolve the conflicts between various sections, um, validate um, the expenditures, clarify and clean up the drafting of the very clause 7 that we are supposed to be to be amending i think mr speaker and i don't say this say this lightly because i have been monitoring the issuance of statutory instruments and so on coming from the ministry of tourism there's a little one that, there's one today that was laid in Parliament, Mr. Speaker, that is a little startling. And maybe not so startling because, not solely because of what it does and what it gives, but because of the legal authority that is cited for it. Now, I'm referring to number 36 of 2018 to Sanders. Now, let me at the outset say that the former government introduced legislation 
that allowed hotels, if their concession period was up, to request that they return to their original concessions as if, of course, they were getting concessions anew. So let us say if a hotel was given 10 years concession in 2007, and the 10 years was in addition to a previous five years, so the number of years allowed ended in 2017. That amendment legislation allowed the hotel to go back as if it were a plan for 2007. Some hotels made use of it. Some did not. But it has been a very useful instrument to assist the hotel sector. This is curious and strange because if you look at section 2 of this order, it says the declared benefits under subsection 1 are applicable for a period of 15 years. I'm reading 2A2 for a period of 15 years commencing from the 15th day of April 2013 and terminating on the 14th day of April 2028, except in respect of construction equipment, which is applicable for a period of five years commencing from the 15th day of April 2013 and terminating on the 14th day of April 2018. Now, the question, therefore, is this. How is that applicable, backdated by five years? And yet, if you look at the exercise of the powers, it says, in exercise of the powers conferred under Section 3, 5, and 13 of the Tourism Incentives Act, Chapter 1530, the minister responsible for tourism with the approval of cabinet makes this order. Where in this act does that authority exist to do this? You can only do this if, of course, you turned to the amending act and decided to backdate the concessions in accordance with that amending act. Now, I'm saying this, Mr. Speaker, to simply make a point that there's a certain amount of carelessness that is occurring with some of these instruments, especially as it pertains to the hotel sector. And there is enough room on the existing legislation to maneuver. Because if you want to backdate concessions of a hotel, you can do so by using that amendment act to take you back there. Not by using the traditional powers. Not by using the traditional powers. And of course, you can ask, you can ask further questions about this because you can ask questions about, well, if you're talking about construction equipment, um, how come you are coming back to 2013 for construction equipment? Presumably, the construction has taken place. So these are issues that needs to be, to be resolved. So Mr. Speaker, I am just making some simple points. First, I am saying that this concept of primary hotel and tourism associations, that needs to be clarified. What are we talking about? Are we talking about a St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, the small business, the small, um, small hotels? Who are we talking about? And who are these trade organizations? Who are we talking about who in these trade organizations? Are we talking about TIPA, for example? Is that what we're talking about? This needs to be clarified. The second point that I'm making is this. If this act is in effect and there is no board, how then does the current chairperson of the board get the authority to exercise expenditure if, if she
she hasn't been given that being given that authority or approval. How did that happen, given the fact that a board should have been in place to do this? The third point, Mr. Speaker, is this the obvious collusion and conflict between some sections of the Act, particularly sections five and six. Now, I don't sense that the members of this side, clearly, would want to stand in the way of amendments to this piece of legislation. It is just clearly saying that there's too much imperfection in this, and this needs to be cleaned up. This really, really needs to be cleaned up. In time, of course, when the board becomes operational, I'm certain that other defects will emerge because there are bound to be defects in this, structural defects. But today is not the day for that, especially with you know, some of the respective powers. But we leave that alone for the time. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I simply want to suggest that maybe the, the, the minister should come and wheel again. Take this, go and clean it up, and come back to Parliament with a clean copy, resolving all these deficiencies, and let's have a debate on a new amendment bill. Well, the leader of the opposition has spoken. He says, that will never happen. I interpret that to mean, well, they may attack me, but what is this? Like water of a duck's back, I'm accustomed to that. Now, how many years are that? 20 years? I'm the most seasoned politician when it comes to attacks. Doesn't matter. So, but I suspect the leader of the opposition is preparing for um, an interesting debate, and perhaps you prefer to see the debate this evening. But, Mr. Speaker, this is too imperfect for Parliament to approve. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, may I suggest at this time, since the Honorable Yes, Honorable Member for Castries, Southeast. Mr. Speaker, in looking at the proposed amendments. You're making your contribution, sir? Yes. No, can I, can I ask you to hear me out first? Okay. Honorable Members, I'm suggesting here, in light of the fact that the Prime Minister is out, as well as the Member or the Minister of Tourism, may I I ask that we suspend the house for the next 10 minutes and then come back. Honorable members, the question is that this house should be suspended for 10 minutes. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see, I, as many as are of a country opinion, see, no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. House is suspended for the next 10 minutes. You are watching the you're watching the live broadcast of the House of Assembly as indicated by the House Speaker, Honorable Andy Daniel. The House has taken a ten minute recess. We ask that you stay tuned to the National Television Network, the Government of St. Lucia YouTube channel, and of course Facebook page.